Hello everyone. Today we're going to start talking about the fundamentals of earthworking. We've been talking about how much equipment costs and we've been talking about how much uh, work um, uh, or how much uh, how to describe <clears throat> the soil in terms of its type and how to read the geotechnical report. What we need to talk about now is the fundamentals, the basics of earth moving. How do we take our, uh, our flywheel horsepower coming off of the engine convert it into useful work, and what do we want to do with that useful work anyway? And so we're going to spend some time this uh, this session going through, I don't know why I did that, see, it drives me crazy. We're going to spend some time going through uh, today's presentation, and then there'll be another lecture that follows up that goes through some of the mathematics that come up towards the end of determining how a vehicle, what amount of work a vehicle can do. So uh, we're continuing on in our session, and the first that we're going to talk about is the fundamentals of earth moving. Earth moving is moving materials from location A to location B. And uh, you might want to know why you want to do that, but usually it's because of the site that you're going to construct on, whether it's a highway or a building site or what have you, is probably not at the elevation that the designer needs it to be at. It's certainly not flat. There's uh, areas that have to be uh, reduced in height. Those are cuts. And there are areas that need to be brought up to an elevation. Those are called fills. And so we have a cut and fill operations or other earth moving where we're taking the existing soil that is uh, that is present uh, at, at the time that the site is being developed and moving it around. We may also be bringing in soil that has certain engineering properties. And we'll talk about that um, in a lecture later on when we talk about compaction. When we want to bring in the soil because our local soils are not strong enough or stiff enough to support the structure that we want without it having move around. So. Uh, sometimes we build a building pad, you know, we've got a, a site that is that is lower than we want it to be and we want to raise the building up and so we have to bring in fill to do that. Other times we want to do a cut. For example, I want to put a, uh, put a beautiful building somewhere but there's a hill in the way. So I'm going to cut that hill down so that it's flat. All of this is earth moving and it, it, it involves several uh, operations. It involves excavating picking up the soil uh, with a piece of equipment. It may involve loading that soil into a haulage vehicle. Either way, we are going to haul it or move it. We may push it with a bulldozer. We may haul it in a, in a uh, dump truck. Where we get to a fill operation, we need to spread the soil. We need to compact the soil. And then we need to grade the soil. All of those uh, operations are going to be done with machines. I mean, you could do it with shovels if you had infinite time and money, but since that's never the case, uh, you're going to use the, uh, the uh, power we have been able to uh, generate from burning fossil fuels. And, and now some of these vehicles are becoming electric um, to do the work that, uh, that we need done. We need to determine how productive this is going to be because we don't get to build the structure for whatever it cost us. We have to put a bid in at the beginning of the project. And in order to do that, we have to be able to estimate our capacity without being on the job. What is that going to depend on? It depends on two things. What soil that we're moving, that's why we talked about our geotechnical report, and how we're going to move it. In other words, what equipment we have available. And in order to do that, we need to read the performance characteristics of those vehicles. Now, we did talk about physical characteristics of soil and uh, how we have fine and coarse grain soils, how we have soils that are at um, are going to uh, going to have uh, different moisture contents. We talked about bulking, the difference in density between the bank, loose, and compacted. And if you recall, the bank is what's sitting there naturally. Loose means it's been dug up, dropped into a, uh, a haulage vehicle, or is being pushed along a grade by a dozer. Either way, it's going to increase its volume. The mass won't change. And then when we go to compact it, we will either be compacting it to be denser or less dense, 
than the base was. And so we're gonna have to be very careful when we say cubic yards. From this point forward, we're gonna to have to indicate in what compaction condition the material is. Because one bank cubic yard may be 1.3 loose cubic yards and maybe 1.1 or 0 0.9 compacted cubic yards. So we're gonna start talking about, about the characteristics of the equipment, how to read the equipment processing charts and how to determine how much work can get done. So let's suppose that we come to a site, we have going to have certain operations that need to take place. The first is clearing and grubbing, which refers to the removal of trees and vegetation and grass and anything else that happens to be sitting uh, on our area we're going to build. Of course, um, some of these, the trees, if their lumber is valuable, we're going to recover that. Uh, if not, we are going to move materials around. Some of those times those materials are composted um, in times past and sometimes in other places, uh, they're burnt in site, in situ, but they, one way or the other, they have to be removed. And that's because organic material, whether it's old organic material like peat, or very recent organic material like the, the, uh, the trees you pushed over with a dozer, they're going to change with time and we don't want them in our building foundation or under our pavements. So we want to get rid of them. We also want to get rid of the topsoil. The topsoil is black dirt, lots of other things. It contains some organic material. It may be, uh, it may be a, a, a silty uh, soil, it may be a sandy soil, but it's going to be full of organic material. Um, that's usually uh, undesirable, almost always undesirable. Uh, unless you're using it to to um, to grow something. Um, often, if you drive by a construction site, you'll see a heap of uh, topsoil. That's because topsoil has a has a value, and we'll sell it to people. And so you can include that in your bid, and you determine how much you recover and how much it costs to put it up into a pile, and uh, and then you can have that as part of your operation. Or, uh, or you can uh, treat it as a windfall profit. Either way, you can, uh, you can end up uh, getting rid of that material. So it's important to know what its quantity is. In addition, even if, we're not, even if we're just flattening a relatively flat piece of soil, we are going to have to excavate. For utilities, water, sewer, power, anything that we want, to be running underground. The sewer is not a pleasant thing to have moved through an open channel, so we don't let anybody do that anymore. Similarly, we don't want our wires to blow down, or we definitely want to be able to carry storm water away from the site when it rains. So we're going to need some uh, some deep excavations. And here in, in Wisconsin and in many parts of the world, we need a foundation that sits below the frost line the depth to which the soil will freeze because soil will expand upon freezing and some soils will really expand upon freezing if you give them a source of water below. So we need to make sure that our footing the, uh, or whatever else we're using for our foundation element is below that frost line. So I said, we, we sometimes when the site is, um, is being graded, and cut and fill, we may have a situation where the excavated material is greater than the amount of material that needs to be put back in compaction. And that's called a waste site. We're gonna have waste soil that needs to be put somewhere. Similarly, sometimes we don't have enough soil on the site and we need to borrow it from somewhere else. And we call that a borrow site. We're also going to want to backfill utility trenches around the foundation and compact fill material. We're going to have to do that. We're going to have to grade the site to meet contract requirements. And we'll have a drawing. I think I have a good drawing that shows you what happens when you grade the site. You'll have two contours, you know, a contour map that shows you the local elevations. One is what it looks like now. And the second is what it's going to look like when you start to build the building or when the building is turned over to the owner. That allows us to calculate how much soil has to be moved, but we'll save that for another day. We're going to need to spread and compact soil in areas to be paved. And typically in a pavement structure, we're going to be bringing in high quality fills. Immediately below the pavement layer, we're going to want 100% crushed um, 
rock. Uh, we, we, we want it to be well graded and we want some fine material in it so that it becomes what engineers call a trimmable, compactable material. In other words, I can compact it. It's not clear stone, but I can also trim it. So if I get it too high, I can come in with a blade and scrape it off without it disturbing too much. And then finally, in those areas where I'm going to put landscaping or grass, I might need some topsoil back. And so I mean, I will need to know what that quantity of topsoil is so that I don't sell it. And if I have to import more so that I include that in my bid. So let's take a look at some pictures. Here is some good old fashioned clearing and grubbing. We've got uh, an excavator up in the, uh, the uh, a hoe, proper term, up in the upper left hand corner. It looks like it's digging some stuff out on the uh, right hand corner, on the upper right hand corner. We have a tractor with a blade that's uh, used for scraping up soils and probably pushing over trees. On the lower left, we can see a bobcat, a, a skid steer, a small um, small uh, front end loader that uh, has a cutting blade and that's been removing the topsoil. And on the lower, you can see we're converting large trees into small chunks of material. So clearing and grubbing a necessary operation because we don't want to see this, uh, to build on this stockpile as in the lower left. You can see the topsoil we're taking out is not going to give us a very good foundation. On the other hand, sometimes we just need a little narrow excavation here. It looks like we're putting in a uh, ductile iron pipe, which is almost always uh, uh, drinking water or the, uh, and so that drinking water is being placed into a trench and you can see there is a, a hoe on the uh, at the end of that trench and it's getting ready to pick up that pipe you can use them as cranes as well and we'll talk about that and inside the trench is a trench box and uh, so that trench is going to have to be not only uh, dug out and you'll have to know how many hours of of uh, uh excavator it takes per um uh, per uh, foot of travel of the trench but you're also going to have to once the pipe's in place Fill it back in. You won't need as much soil. And in some cases, you can't use the same soil because it isn't the proper soil for bedding the pipe and preventing it from uh, breaking when it settles. Here's a, here's a step footing uh, in a building, and you can see the trench has been cut so that, um, and, and the footing is, is stepping up so that uh, it's a sloped portion of the structure. And in this case, we're going to place concrete in those uh, forms for the footing. We use the lower piece of soil for the bottom form, and that will give us our footing. We're going to have to backfill, fill in that space once the footing and the wall are in place. Here is a happy gentleman working in a happy trench. That trench box prevents him from worrying about having an accident, because even if the soil was to slough off, it's unable to crush those large uh, tubes that are acting as, as uh, columns to prevent those two uh, layers from coming together. And I can't see, is that Mountain Dew or Canada Dry? But anyways, and then here you can see, here's the strip footing for a building on level, but the strip footing is down below the uh, elevation, uh, finished elevation of the slab, which is likely what we're seeing there. And so it has had to be dug out we're going to place the footings and then uh, those uh, stubby walls with the protector or stubby bars coming up with the protectors will get foundation walls on them. But then that's all going to have to be backfilled, some of it inside and some of it outside of the building. We need to be able to tell ourselves that we're confident how much that's going to cost based on what equipment we try to do and how much we're going to move per, uh, per unit time. Here we're placing some utilities. This is uh, this is not in uh, in North America. To remind you that we see a lot of places uh, that do construction, and in those areas of construction, we have the opposite. This uh, gentleman uh, here in the uh, in, in near the center, towards the bottom of the drawing, is in a very risky condition. If that soil was to fail, uh, the wind would be knocked out of him, and no matter how hard they how quickly they dug, they would not be able to remove him from the trench. Don't do that. So, taking excess material away that's not needed for backfill. We have several operations. Up above, 
in this uh, photograph you can see there's a hoe it's picking up material and it's putting it into a, uh, a shaker that is shaking and uh, separating the particles by size some of them are going in one direction and some of them are uh, are going in another and those uh, th that type of sorting is done when we can uh, when we can make money out of selling one of the particle sizes here's the other way that's being done and the, the uh, key to look at this photograph is we're picking up soil with that hoe and we're putting it into a haulage truck but do you see that the hoe makes sure it's sitting up at a higher elevation than the truck it's astonishing over time how much faster that operation is if the truck uh, bed and the tracks of the hoe are at the same elevation here's another one put some uh, soil into another um, haulage vehicle you can see that this is not an on-road haulage vehicle it has uh, directional tires that's why those uh, chevron uh, semi chevrons on the tires are pointed in one direction and the soil is pretty loose and then uh, you know do lots of other things the, if you uh, you if you want you could uh, use a bucket excavator or a bucket uh, elevator rather and move uh, soil out by loading it and that is meant being deposited into a haulage vehicle and sometimes you have to do that when you can't get heavy equipment in place backfilling happens almost every project even the smallest of projects this is a uh, this is a ride on bulldozer fully tracked rubber track so perhaps not uh, not as great as we'd want it to be and the tracks are non unit are non-directional because the chevrons on them are or semi chevrons are straight and we have the blade canted to one side and as it advances forward it pushes the spoil that we use for excavating that trench back into the hole and so that's a piece of equipment it's going to have a certain productivity it's going to cost a certain amount of money and it's going to be able to do a certain amount of work here's a backfill uh, looks like a residential house that uh, that seems to be that fiberglass uh, uh, escape uh, window in the basement and you can see the excavator is moving soil from uh, a pile and dropping it and hopefully we're compacting it and then here's a uh, here's another one we have a front end loader that's picking up soil and dropping it into the uh, into the trench what does it mean to compact material and compacting material is pretty straightforward we take the soil and we press on it so that the particles get closer together the net volume drops and the strength of the soil increases significantly we'll have a lecture i get this week that talks about something called the proctor curve and the proctor maximum dry density is a target that we use to determine the strength of the soil here um, this illustration is showing you a uh, a roller it may be vibratory which means the rollers are going up and down or it may be smooth but it's compacting soil and this type of roller is used for for coarse grained or uh, fine grained non-cohesive soil like sand or gravel there uh, we need to be careful because the soil will push in all directions if you were to roll that roller uh, in that area they're looking at two-thirds of the height of that retaining wall on the other side um, you are then putting a very large force much larger than it was designed for onto the wall and the footing so typically there we'll do hand operated light equipment a plate tamper or maybe a walk behind plate roll or a walk behind roller but if that larger vehicle gets in you can cause that structure to fail you can also uh, imagine that's not a retaining wall if that's the, the foundation wall for your building you may push that wall in during compaction so you want to stay very far away at least two-thirds of the height away from the, uh, the soil for fear you surcharge it this um, is an example of a poorly compacted material if you dump a large amount of material into the excavation and then roll over the top surface you will densify the top surface the effect of density typically we like to see you know 12 15 18 inch lifts and that will be information provided to you by the geotechnical engineer um, in this particular case if we drop in four feet we can roll across it with a roller and we'll only densify that uh, that soil at the surface 
what will happen over time is the looser soil that is below will compact you know with the action of rain uh, with the action of loading and then we will get uh, settlement and some of you may have seen that uh, in um, often residential driveways will come up nicely and then they'll have a dip right when they hit the garage because they don't compact the soil very well in residential construction there's a piece of uh, of uh, walk behind equipment being used to uh, to compact uh, soil bedding around or soil not the bedding this is the, uh, the side of a uh, of a, that's a what they call corrugated um, uh, rubber or corrugated plastic pipe so that's a, a storm sewer and that piece of equipment is a light piece of equipment it can work right up against the edge and you'll notice there's little feet projecting from the drum it's not smooth like in the photographs that uh, drum is in fact a sheep's foot which uh, will help us to knead the soil and is good at compacting cohesive soils clays and of course there's the proverbial jumping jack of uh, uh, which is uh, allows you to exert a force uh, in the down direction um, usually gasoline or uh, a gasoline power that that are now four stroke used to be two stroke engines and that will act to compact the soil as well you need to grade the site in addition to compacting it and that grading operation includes several pieces one of which is the use of a of a grade a grader which is in the left hand side and you can see it has a mortar board a blade in between the wheels and that can be used for fine grading for smoothing out the soil the upper right hand corner is a very large uh, fill on uh, cut and fill operation and you can see all the important parts that are going on there's a scraper that's the vehicle at the top that's uh, that's headed uh, we're going right to left there's some dozers up in the upper right hand corner there's a water truck down uh, down the grade uh, uh, watering the uh, hull road there's another scraper you can see by that little gooseneck that curve we'll talk about scrapers and then a grader and the back of that grader has a bunch of teeth you can see that looks like a claw and that's a uh, that can be used to rip the soil up loosen the soil or decompact it and in the bottom right hand corner is a gentleman using a, a gps uh, a surveying equipment to determine what elevation they're at now uh, and he's helping to control the fill operation what happens today is we can get these vehicles to uh, have their own gpr on them or gps that tells them where they are and they know where the blade is relative to the gps and they can do all that fine grading by themselves once we uh once we've excavated the soil from the places that uh, we don't want it we go put it where we do and uh, this is a uh, this is an operation that is uh, doing th two things one is it's uh, it's spreading the soil and you can see the soil has been spread out in layers there's then a sheep's foot compactor that's that vehicle in the middle with the projections. You can see the, the texture that it leaves in the soil. And when those feet, those fingers push into the soil, it compacts them down, but also to the side. Very effective. It kneads it like kneading bread. Very effective for compacting clay type soils. Then there's a smooth uh, roller that is, uh, that is uh, doing the finish grading to make it uh, smooth enough to work on that white and gray vehicle is a mill and you can see beyond the mill there is white sort of a gray material and that's portland cement has been put onto the surface and it's working the soil and the portland cement together it's called cement stabilization it uh, improves the capacity or improves the performance of the soil so um, and this is a uh, this is a very interesting operation there's a lot of things going on in that one photograph here's a highway uh, operation where the uh, uh, the trucks come in and they dump material out and they dump it in uh, in uh, in a pile or several wind road piles and then a dozer is used to blade it flat and a roller comes in and rolls it that's a very common operation Topsoil spread by dozers. Sometimes you can uh, you can rig equipment, and this is a residential on this uh, on this skid steer vehicle. Again, 
this is a, a dozer with a uh, with a bucket. Uh, it's a, a tracked loader. And uh, here's a these kids here again with the bucket on it being used to place topsoil. So pretty straightforward operation. In order to understand how much work we can do, we're going to need to see how we turn flywheel horsepower into useful work. And it's going to depend very much on how our vehicle is designed to transfer that power, flywheel horsepower, into motive power, the power to do move and to push or pull. And that's going to be very dependent on tracked versus wheeled vehicles. A tracked vehicle does not have any rolling resistance. So we're going to put that aside for a second. We'll show you how to handle track vehicles. And the first piece of equipment we'll look at is bulldozers or dozers. And dozers uh, are almost invariably tracked for, uh, for a very good reason. That's because they're the first people in there. Rolling resistance can be a problem. But rolling resistance refers to the fact that a tire in soil is pushing in all directions and the part that pushes down means that we penetrate into the ground and in order to roll forward or in reverse we have to be perpetually climbing a hill and that hill is the hill that's created by our vehicle that that is created by our vehicle having to go uphill and you can see here's a grade that this tire is actually climbing and that's what we're going to our rolling resistance we're going to uh, differentiate from our grade resistance but it's essentially the same thing the vehicle even on a flat surface is attempting to climb similarly the uh there's uh, friction in the wheel bearings and that can make a difference and so we're going to look and see what we can get and their rolling resistance is going to be expressed as the pounds of resistance per ton of gross vehicle weight and you've uh, you've all experienced this if you have uh, a four-wheel drive low geared uh, pickup truck it can still get stuck in the snow because it has to perpetually climb out of the snow and your rolling resistance gets very high. The gross vehicle weight, again, is the weight of the vehicle without any load plus whatever load it's carrying. So loaded vehicles are able to, uh, are able to, ha uh, to have a higher gross vehicle weight, therefore they have a higher rolling resistance. So, our rolling resistance is going to be R plus 30 pounds per ton per inch of tire penetration. For example, if you uh, are out on site and you see that your tires are penetrating two inches into the material, then you'll know that your um, that your rolling resistance in pounds per ton is going to be 40 or 30, depending on whether you're using a radial or dual tire, so probably 30, plus 30 mul pounds per ton multiplied by 3 inches of tire penetration gives me 30, plus 90 is 120 pounds of rolling resistance per ton. Sometimes and in every case when we're bidding it we don't have a clue because we're not on the site yet so how much tire uh, penetration are we going to get we're going to find out so we're going to have to estimate it and uh, you can see there's a table below here table 6.1 it's our representative rolling resistances for various types of surfaces if we're operating on asphalt or concrete a rolling resistance is 40 pounds per ton. Very, very stiff, hard, non-penetrable surfaces. If we're operating in loose gravel or loose sand, it could be 200 pounds a ton 
Um, some of you may have had the experience of running on the beach and where the beach is dry and loose, most of your effort goes into pushing the particles away, not pushing yourself forward, as opposed to a smooth, hard surface of uh, sand where the water is, it's only 50 pounds per ton. And that's why it's harder for you to run on loose sand, and for that matter, harder for vehicles to run on loose sand. So we'll talk about uh, some aspects of that, but this is what we're gonna need to understand is our rolling resistance is a function of the tire and how stiff the soil that we're pushing against is. And this, um, this can give us a, uh, a resistive force. How much force do we need to overcome? And that resistance force is the rolling resistance multiplied by the gross vehicle weight, which is the weight of the vehicle plus the weight of the load. And this is critical because if you use a vehicle that is too powerful for your site, you get the work done, but it might cost too much. If you use a vehicle that is underpowered, it's either going to be operated unsafely or it's not going to be able to keep up with your production requirements and that's going to cost you as well. And so understanding these things is going to be important in meeting our requirements of management. Then of course, we have one we're a little bit more familiar with and that is the grade resistance. The grade resistance is the force of gravity that is pulling down the slope as you're moving up. It's also the force of gravity that's pushing you down the slope as you're moving down. And so we refer to that as a, uh, an assisting or a retarding grade. An assisting grade goes down and a, uh, and a uh, retarding grade goes up. They're usually expressed in terms of a percentage, which is the number of feet that you would go up as you go forward. For example, if you have a 5% slope, that means every 100 feet you go up five. A minus 2% slope, for every 100 feet you roll forward, you're going down two. And so we can, uh, we can convert this grade resistance using a little bit of geometry into a pound per ton resistance or a force resistance by assuming that we're going to get 20 pounds per ton per percent slope. In other words, if we're going up a 6% slope and our, um, our uh, grain resistance would then be uh, 20 pounds multiplied by that 20% slope, which would be a 400 pound force opposing motion we're going down that slope then it's 20 times 20 percent which gives us a 400 pound force pushing us forward in addition to anything the vehicles do okay and grade resistance affects all vehicles the rolling resistance is only for rubber tires the tracks don't flex and the tracks don't care if they penetrate but rubber tires do we can convert that just like we did with our rolling resistance into a force grade resistance multiplied by the gross vehicle weight and that will give us our resisting force if you have a vehicle that's too powerful it costs too much if you have one that isn't powerful enough it also costs too much sorry let's see if we can get this in here so we have to overcome the total force, the total resisting force acting against forward or reverse movement is the sum of the grade resistance and the rolling resistance. For tracked equipment, the rolling resistance is equal to zero. So the vehicle must be able to overcome the force of this resistance in order to move and perform the desired task. 
if you use the wrong pieces of equipment, then you can get into trouble. Here you can see a, uh, a tractor, which is a, a track, fully tracked tractor, and it's hauling stuff and it's going uphill and it is not happy. It's pulling a scraper, by the way, which we'll talk about. What you can see here, it's making it, but not as well as it could. First, it's about to encounter some additional grade. You can see him changing gears. Gonna go down and get more power with a lower gear ratio. Now we're climbing. Yeah, I'm gonna have a drink. Why is that guy filming me? You can see that cat, that caterpillar tracker did not like going up that slope because it's under power. And he had to change gears again with a delay. And now he's wheeling away, someone looking for their lost cat. All right, so you can see that's a little bit of a problem. All right, that's, um, that is what, uh, what um, we wanted to cover in terms of vehicles. Now, how do we know what all these things are? It's all well and good for me as your professor to say, oh, make sure you have a power vehicle that's powerful enough, but not too powerful. And that's, um, that's an easy answer because we can go to the manufacturer and we can say, what's the capability of, you know, the Kevco X500 tractor? And um, it depends whether it's a wheel tractor or a track tractor, but we're going to go through these two concepts, drawbar pull, and rim pull and the, the easier one is drawbar pull so we'll do it first at the back of a dozer is a bar but to which you can attach a hook and you can tow things and that is the drawbar so we talk about the drawbar is the ability of a tracked piece of equipment to move itself and its load if the load is like we saw uh, with that vehicle trying to climb the hill, a scraper, or if the load was the, the vehicle rates are right at the beginning, which is pushing some soil, those are the loads. And that's the drawbar pull. And the manufacturer will provide you with information on the performance of the vehicle that gives you the available drawbar pull at various speeds and gears under standard conditions which means at sea level. And you can use these charts to determine how much work a vehicle is gonna be capable of doing. This is a drawbar pull chart for a Caterpillar D6R with steering clutch and brakes. The, this um, curve is very useful. We can compute the res total resistive force which would be the grade resistance and in this case only the grade resistance and the uh, weight that we're needing to push once we have that total resistive force we assume that we need a drawbar pull of that force, in this case, we need eight pounds per thousand tons of gross vehicle weight. So not, uh, not a very uh, large number. We then mark that force on the vertical axis, draw a horizontal line until we intersect the maximum speed. And it's uh, that uh, those lines are the capabilities of the vehicle in first second and third gear. You'll notice that third gear gives you the highest speed, but first gear gives you 
the largest draw bar pull. And that's why we gear our vehicle so that when we need a lot of power, we can transfer it to the, uh, to the uh, engine in such a way that it uh, pushes hard. In other, words, in other uh, realms, we can change the uh, gearing so that it doesn't push as hard, but it's moving faster. So if we, uh, if we look in this case, if the uh, total uh, resistive force is 8,000 pounds, draw a line until we hit the gear that we want. Well, let's take the highest speed, of course, and we get four point, uh, about 4 point, actually about 4.6 miles per hour. And uh, we'll use imperial units or a U.S. common system. And it's also given in, in uh, kilograms so that you can use SI. And uh, this type of curve is available for all sorts of equipment. This one in particular, as I said, happens to be a D6R Caterpillar. Tires are a little bit different. Rim pull is the power available to move a wheeled piece of equipment. And that is the pushing force that is available to the tires on the operating surface. It's a power expressed in pounds of force that's available at the rims of the driving wheels. You need to, again, get manufacturer's information and it's readily available, particularly if you're buying them. Um, you'd be surprised what they'll give you, even hats that say Caterpillar. And these charts can be used to determine the capacity. So what do these look like? In these particular cases, we are going to want to measure our total resistance in terms of grade and rolling resistance expressed as a percent or our maximum force. So right now we're going to use the maximum force method, but we're going to also talk about very quickly uh, when we deal with wheeled vehicles, how we convert everything into rolling resistance uh, or an equivalent total resistance, rolling and grade resistance. So how do we do it? We compute our total resistive force, in this case, 5,000 pounds. Um, we uh, know that we need a, a resistive force of at least that large. We go to five, we move across until we intersect one of the gears, and then we drop a vertical to tell us what our speed is. And so we're gonna end up with 5,000 pounds of drawbar pull, sorry, 5,000 pounds of rim pull, and we're going to be able to go about 21 miles an hour. And uh, we're also going to uh, be able to correct and then uh, take a look at uh, another piece of information. And that is the, uh, you can see there's a dotted line that is marked E and another dotted line that's marked L. Those are the empty and loaded to the manufacturer's capacity rating of the vehicles. If you don't have manufacturing information, you can make some assumptions. We can use the assumption that the maximum speed that the vehicle is going to be able to perform at is 375 multiplied by the horsepower uh, uh, at the flywheel, so the flywheel horsepower, multiplied by gear train efficiency and divided by our required rim pull and our required effort to do work. The gear train efficiency is a function of gearing ratios and somewhere between 0.7 and 0.85 is where you're going to find. But there are very few pieces of equipment that you would need to, uh, you would need to do this for and we'll provide you with the, I'll provide you with the curves as we go along. There is a, there's an effect of altitude. The higher up you go, the less oxygen there is. Therefore, for a given, a given throttle position and a given gearing, you do less work. We'll have a derating or derating factor, a factor that says, well, you're 2,000 feet above sea level, and so you need to reduce your um, horse horse fat, your flywheel horsepower by that uh, amount. And you will be able to I'll show you how to do that uh, when we're talking about vehicles. But that effective altitude is important to take into account 
although um, we uh, typically um, unless you're uh, unless you're up thousands of feet above sea level it's not too bad so let's take a look here we have uh, the manufacturer's uh, equipment uh, for a uh, for uh, various types of bulldozers this is um, this is from the uh, this is from caterpillar again these are for uh, for various engines we can take a look and you can see let's go to what we were looking at a d6r take the d6r series 3 at uh, up to uh, up to 2500 feet above sea level you can use 100 percent of the capacity up to uh, continuing over we don't start derating the material or the vehicle rather until it's at 10,000 feet above sea level. So very frequently we're uh, we're not going to have that problem. But uh, we'll also want to look at the uh, at the engine. And if we look here, this uh, table up in the upper right hand corner is a 545D diesel engine uh, made by Caterpillar, and it's telling you that. Uh, you don't have to derate it unless you're at 9,843 feet. The last thing that we need to consider is how much work can we actually do? Um, we've all had this uh, had this position. We have a, a very high horsepower vehicle and it's penetrated into the snow, so it's going slower and put it into a lower gear and then it gets stuck because it can't climb up something. And then as the wheel turns, the simplest way for the vehicle to, um, to do work is to turn the wheel without moving the vehicle. We've on, we're onto a patch of ice, and uh, the harder we spin the tires, the more ice we generate. <clears throat> Not a desirable condition. <clears throat> and as a consequence, we are not able to get any work done. And that's because our coefficient of traction will tell us how much of the how much work we can actually do because if our coefficient of traction multiplied by the weight of the vehicle is less than the force we're trying to exert then uh, we're not going anywhere the <clears throat> the tires or the tracks will slip on the surface and then we will have no drawbar pull and so our maximum drawbar pull or maximum <clears throat> rim pull that's available is going to be equal to the gross vehicle weight on a driving wheel or a track multiplied by the coefficient of traction c sub t and you can see again from the caterpillar handbook <clears throat> on the right hand side <clears throat> there's a lot of things that are obvious to us let's take a look at rubber tires on concrete we have a coefficient of traction of 0.9 it's very easy for us to uh to use almost all of the gross vehicle weight of the vehicle to do work if we look at dry sand it's only at 0 0.20 so it's packed snow at 0 0.20 but what is interesting is wet clay, where you're going to have some potential slippage of the tires, you get a 0.45. So the gross vehicle weight is 80,000 pounds, then 80,000 pounds multiplied by 0.4 is 32,000 pounds. That's the maximum rim pull you can get. I don't care what the gearing is. And so you need to be aware of that. Tracks are different. On concrete, tracks are not efficient. Tracks have little projections that come out of them called grousers. Those grousers dig into the soil and they act as a lever. They don't dig into the concrete, so that's not good. However, <clears throat> looking at that dry sand, or rather at that wet sand, we have an improvement in our ability. Look at, uh, look at the difference between um, Firm earth, which would be uh, you know, soil that's been rolled over a few times, but really isn't compacted. Um, you getting a 0.55 or 55% of the gross vehicle weight is all the rubber tired vehicle can do, but 90%, just like rubber tires on concrete, 
of the gross vehicle weight of your tracked vehicle is what you can end up doing. And so that's just why we have some vehicles that are wheeled and some vehicles that are tracked that look exactly the same, because depending on where you're operating, you might want the other type of, uh, of driving of driving train or of, uh, of drivetrain. Okay. As far as the weight distribution for empty and loaded vehicles, scrapers, trucks, haulers, that can all be found in the manufacturer's literature. And the maximum amount of usable tractive force is the gross vehicle weight on the driving <clears throat> wheels of the tracks multiplied by the coefficient of variation. <clears throat> Excuse me. In, uh, in some of these uh, <clears throat> cases, all wheels will be driven, but it's the, uh, it's the drive wheel, the one that is, has the largest gross vehicle weight, which in that articulated Caterpillar truck, it's articulated because the cab is uh, connected to the load with a single, single pin hinge. Uh, it's going to be the forward drive wheels. All right, so we're going to have a little bit <clears throat> of a discussion. There's also on the, uh, and, and a little bit of an assignment, there's also a second discussion uh, available to you um, on this same YouTube channel, which walks through some of the mathematics and explains it in a, a slightly different way. All right, next thing we're going to deal with is dozers and loaders. Good luck.